Today marks the one-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis joins us now to go over what to expect in year two. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me back. Yeah, great to speak with you. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a happy milestone, obviously, to be gearing up for year two of the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, what possibilities do you are, are you looking at for potential peace? Is there any, or are we really going to do another full year of so many lives lost and so much devastation across the Ukrainian country? You know, as I've been talking uh, really throughout the last year, every time I come on your show, I'm always talking about how what we need to do is get to a diplomatic resolution to save more uh, Ukrainian people and, and Ukrainian service members. Uh, unfortunately, we're moving the exact opposite direction as we may reach the one year mark. And now entering into the second year, you just had these uh, dueling speeches by uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, President Biden both moving in the opposite direction, saying that both are digging in their heels. They're going to put even more pressure on, uh, you know, and they're more committed to victory than ever. And the reality is that there probably is no military path for either side to, to attain a complete military victory, though the, the military advantage still does lie in Russia for several reasons. But the, the cost to the Ukraine side so far has just been astronomical. Uh, and that's what most of this in the West are concerned about. And, and if this thing does continue through another full year, and right now Russia is in the appears to be in the early stages of of their uh, 2023 offensive, uh, it's not certain that Ukraine can absorb the losses. And forget about how many tanks and uh, APCs and other things we may provide. If they don't have the manpower to continue the operation, it, it's not clear that they can even sustain what they have, much less push Russia out anywhere. When you say the manpower is a consideration, I mean, is it? Are we really in a situation where the loss of life is such that they will? There's a real risk of them running out of of military members to have to institute a kind of mandatory conscription. Things like that would affect the kind of political posture and maybe the popularity of a conflict in Ukraine. I mean, what exactly are we talking about here? Yeah, that's just unfortunately not gotten much uh, publicity here because everybody's focused on all these tanks that we promised and these Challengers and the, the Leopard 2s and, and the M1 Abrams, et cetera, maybe jets. But what they're not paying attention to is the is the human composed component of that, because Ukraine already is in their fourth round of mobilizations, which doesn't get a lot of prep priority here. But I mean, even according to the most conservative Pentagon assessments, the uh, U Ukraine side has lost somewhere around 120, 130,000 men. And they just don't have as many men to mobilize as the Russians does. The Russian mobilized 300,000 last fall, and they could easily do another half million. Ukraine, on the other hand, couldn't. So if this current fight, like say into the summer, you know, Russia suffers huge casualties, Ukraine suffers huge casualties, Russia could bring another half million on with very little difficulty, but the Ukraine side can't. And at some point, the balance could become so much that it just shifts heavily in one favor through sheer attrition. That's just a realistic mm. possibility. You know, when you hear President Biden speak about this and continue to use the rhetoric of whatever it takes, as long as it takes, he's used that phrase repeatedly. Other members of the State Department have used it. Uh, do you do you think there's any reckoning or self-reflection in our in our government, in our military, in the people, you know, sending sending the aid and thinking about how to best help Ukraine? Are they you know, are they paying any attention to the to the perhaps looming date where e no matter all the weapons in the world aren't going to help unless you have people to use them? And, and is that you know, is that tipping toward I mean, God forbid, using American troops? Well, it certainly hope that doesn't ever come into to focus. But but apparently there are people in the United States that are starting to think about this. There was a I believe it was an Ipsos poll I saw this morning that uh, in, in April of last year, 73 percent of Americans said they were willing to support Ukraine for as long as it takes with whatever they need. And now that number is down to 58 percent after one year. And if the, the war continues on without any resolution and just high casualties, you can count on that number going down, especially as we you know, it start talking about issues like the 
the uh, the debt ceiling and, and other issues financing for us. And people are going to start saying, now, why are we just perpetually sending money out here? And they'll start to make analogies with the uh, Afghanistan situation where we just sent billions every year and it never made any difference. And I think that we may get into that. And that's something that the White House needs to start thinking about. Yeah, I mean, you'd hope that the White House, that the Biden administration would be, you know, be able to figure out exactly what, what you just laid out, that there will come a day, maybe weeks from now, maybe months from now, where the Ukrainians can mobilize sufficient troops, even with all the support we're giving them. And, and given that that day is coming sooner or later, you would think there would be more strategic thinking now. It, it, why, wait, why just wait till there's no one left standing to then have diplomacy? Why wouldn't we just do it now if that day is coming? Well, Robbie, I think because nobody's thinking about the, the, hmm. the human element of it. They're just thinking about numbers of tanks and maybe F-16 fighters. And people are just thinking about the, the military equipment. Then they're going, OK, an M1 Abrams against a T-72. That's all they're thinking about. But you've got to talk, think about the people who are going to man that Abrams and who are going to man these jets if they ever come in. Oh, and the fact that there's just millions more on the Russian side, and if Russia's willing to pay that price, then sheer volume and attrition can one day win the, win the battle. And just people don't seem to want to think about that part of it. Yeah, I mean, another uh, factor that might uh, influence how long this conflict persists is the political pressure, not just that— um, Biden might be experiencing at home from folks that are concerned that money be, is being spent overseas that will be spent on uh, domestic issues, but also among uh, U.S. allies in Europe. Yesterday, we were able to speak to Cy Hirsch about his reporting about potential mm. U.S. involvement in the Nord Stream pipeline explosion and the lo long-term ongoing tensions between the U.S. and Germany about its choice to fund the Nord Stream pipelines and create a reliance on Russian natural gas um, that made it torn, basically put in the position of being the country that took the hit for the strategic choice to cut off uh, and sanction Russia uh, to isolate it uh, economically. And he was making the point that although we were able to get through this first winter, now spring is coming, and some of the pressures that come mm -hmm. along with uh, Oh, uh, heating costs that are two, three, four, five times higher than normal in Eastern Europe, that as we head into year two of this in the next winter, that the pressure uh, among uh, for our allies to continue to support this U.S. proxy war might create some tensions there. What do you make of that analysis? And what pressures is is uh, our Vladimir Putin facing in Russia uh, from from Russians? Is there uh, any political pushback mm -hmm. within that country about the resources that are being put into this war? Yeah, I, I actually just spoke with a colleague uh, last week, in fact, uh, about this whole issue of the Russian. I'm sorry, the German view of the Nord Stream story that's coming out, uh, and it, there seems to be pretty wide acceptance that that you know that did happen the way that Hirsch is saying that it did, and frankly, you don't even need Hirsch's analysis to understand who benefited, who had the capacity and who lost. And, uh, you know, it's probably likely that happened. He, my colleague was surprised, who has some, some fairly high level German contacts, that the Germans at this point were not as upset as you might think that they might be, even though they were the, the losers in this. But you can't say that that's going to be the case over time. And it's especially as more time passes and, the, and they're asked to do more and more. Uh, they're not going to be willing to do that, I don't think, and that's going to start to wane. On the other side, in terms of the Putin's position, his is stronger than ever. Uh, it is very clear that the, the Russian across the board uh, in their, their society and in their leadership and their politics are completely on board with this because they view this as an existential threat. They view this as a Western attack against them and everything except maybe pulling the trigger, but everything else, this, they're, they're providing lethal support against them. And, of course, now we see in just the last few days that uh, Secretary Blinken is saying that we have intelligence that China is now considering putting lethal support behind Russia, not just some of the emotional and other support that they've been providing. And, again, that could just further tip the balance in Moscow's favor and something we don't have any control over. Hmm. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate it. Always my pleasure. Thanks, Robbie. More Rising right after this. Stay tuned.